Good morning, and uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak to you after the conclusion of a very successful mission. Uh, we, of course, are the crew of, of Space Lab J, uh, STS-47, which, of course, was the 50th flight of the space shuttle. And I'd like to reintroduce the crew. Uh, right to my right, our mission pilot, Major Kurt Brown, who was making his first flight aboard uh, Space Lab J. Our payload commander, mission specialist number one, Mark Lee, making his second flight aboard Space Lab J. Our flight engineer, or mission specialist number two, Jay Apt, making his second flight on this mission. <coughs> mission specialist number three, Jan Davis, making her first flight aboard STS-47. Our mission specialist number four, Dr. Mae Jemison, making her flight, first flight. Mm -hmm. And our mm -hmm. payload specialist number one, mm -hmm. Dr. Mamoru Mori, uh, the first Japanese astronaut, making his first flight aboard STS-47. We're here today to tell you our story, to tell you the story of Space Lab J, and I think we can best do that with some of the images from the mission. So uh, the crew will describe the mission as we saw it using our video images and our still images. This is shuttle launch control at T minus three hours and holding. You see the astronauts at the breakfast table for this morning's uh, launch attempt. There's mission specialist Jan Davis and her husband, payload commander Mark Lee. Here is uh, shuttle pilot Kurt Brown, and this morning's STS-47 commander, Hoot Gibson. There's a mission specialist and flight engineer, Jay Apt. Mission specialist, May Jamison. And the payload specialist, Dr. Mamoru Mori of Japan. Half of the crew were awakened at about 4.58 this morning, and the other three were awakened at 5.28 in preparation for this morning's launch attempt. Sitting in the middle of the table is a traditional cake made for every launch team, and it has the emblem uh, STS-47 crew patch. This is the STS-47 crew patch, which was designed by the astronauts. You can see the uh, oval-shaped logo is surrounded by the names of the seven astronauts. SLJ on the left side stands for Space Lab Japan, with the Japanese letters on the right meaning Fuwato, or weightlessness in Japanese. The shuttle orbiter is flanked by the flags of the uh, United States on its starboard side, and the flag of Japan on the port side. And you can see that the orbiter is flying over uh, the United States state of Alaska and the country of Japan. And this is indicative of the 57 degree or high inclination orbit that we'll be having over the seven day flight. We're currently standing by to receive uh, some video of the astronauts, the STS-47 crew, as they're donning their flight pressure suits in preparation for today's launch. Here's Commander Hoot Gibson. Uh, Gibson is uh, gonna be making his fourth trip in space today a veteran of three previous flights, most re recently uh, the launch of Atlantis on STS-27 back in November of 1988. Here's Mission Specialist and Payload Commander Mark Lee. Lee will be making his second trip in space today. He flew previously on STS-34 Here you see pilot Kurt Brown being assisted with the uh, donning of his gloves. Brown will be making his first trip in space today. These uh, orange day glow outfits are essentially uh, pressure suits that the astronauts wear during in entry into Earth orbit and re-entry back here upon landing. Here's Japanese payload specialist, Dr. Mamoru Mori. Uh, Dr. Mori will become the first uh, professional Japanese astronaut to fly in space today. And he's very pleased to be going and, and gives us a thumbs up. Mori has been training to fly on the SLJ mission for about seven years. He's a mission specialist and STS-47 flight engineer, Jay Apt. Apt is uh, checking out his communications on his helmet and he'll be making his second trip in space. Uh, 
having flown previously on STS-37 when the Compton Gamma Ray Observatory was deployed. Footage inside the uh, Operation and Checkout Building crew quarters is provided by uh, technicians with the Lockheed Space Operations Company and with photographers and a film cameraman from the Bionetics Corporation. Here you see Mae Jameson. Mae Jameson will be making her first trip in space today. And she's also very enthusiastic and ready to fly. Jameson is a medical doctor from Chicago. Here you see Mission Specialist Jan Davis. Uh, Davis will be making her first trip in space today. <laughs> this is Shuttle Launch Control at T-minus 2 hours 55 minutes, and the STS-47 astronauts have just emerged from their suit-up room in the astronaut quarters. Commander Hood Gibson and pilot Kurt Brown leading the way, and uh, Japanese payload specialist Mamoru Mori and mission specialist Mae Jameson picking up the rear. And here they come from the uh, operation and checkout building. Commander Hoot Gibson leading the way, followed by Kurt Brown, Jay App, Mark Lee and his wife Jan Davis, Mae Jameson, and Mamoru Mori. They've trained a long time for this mission, seven years for Dr. Mori, uh, two or more years for the rest of the crew, and they're ready to fly today. A lot of uh, press interest in this mission. We uh, have more than 100 members of the Japanese media who've come out to see the their payload specialist, Dr. Mori off, and everybody's uh, pretty excited. A lot of flashes going off there, and a lot of applause. The crew will journey to the launch pad in this specially outfitted uh, recreational vehicle, which is called the Astro Van, and it's about a 10-mile trip out to pad 39B. The crew should be out there in about 20 minutes. Out of the pad, the Shuttle Endeavor and members of the closeout crew await their arrival. Once at the foot of the pad, the astronauts will take the elevator to the 195-foot level of the fixed service structure, where they'll begin entry into Endeavor. T-minus 17 seconds, we're coming up on a go for main engine start. Well, at T-minus six seconds, uh, main engine is starting, and uh, shortly at T-0, we started the 50th one. mission of the space shuttle. Solid rocket ignition, and liftoff, liftoff of Endeavour on America's 50th space shuttle flight. Houston now controlling. Once we're clear of the tower, we began our roll maneuver, which Roger puts us in the endeavor. orbital plane that our mission would be in, and that was 57 degrees of inclination. Orbiter's now in a heads down position on course for a 57 degree, 160 nautical mile orbit. And shortly after liftoff, uh, we reach 20,000 feet and already by then we're at uh, Mach 1 and you'll be able to see some of the shock waves off the external tank and solid rocket boosters. 67% as Endeavour prepares to pass through the area of maximum dynamic pressure. Endeavour Houston, go at throttle up. Watch your go at throttle up. One minute, 20 seconds into the flight. Endeavour is now seven miles from the launch site, altitude 11 nautical miles. Now traveling 2,400 feet per second or about 1,700 miles per hour. The next event is a burnout of the solid rocket boosters. That occurs at about two minutes. Endeavour Houston, UHF comm check. How do you read? Houston, 
Two minutes into the flight now. And not much longer after that, about two minutes into the flight, uh, we've used all the energy we can get out of our solid rocket boosters and we separate from those. And now we're only on the, uh, the main engines for another eight minutes. Solid rocket booster separation confirmed. Standing by for the first stage performance call. Endeavour Houston, performance nominal. Roger, copy nominal performance. Once we got up, uh, we turned our, our rocket ship into a spacecraft by opening the payload bay doors there and got ready uh, to activate that laboratory you see in the bay. And heading down the tunnel, uh, the more I look at this picture, it's kind of like uh, taking a subway. This is Mission Control. These are our live views uh, it's about, of the uh, crew starting to come into the Space Lab uh, module. And Endeavour Houston, we're with you now in Space Lab J. You have to make a little jog as you go into uh, the the lab here and you can see you got to stick your hand out to stop <laughs> a little bit but once you're in the lab uh, we started activation we got back there about three and a half uh, hours finally, into the mission and the activation back, uh, was uh, very smooth after uh, screening for, at this for a long time we got uh, Memoro probably blinding you a little bit with the camera but uh, taking a few pictures with a 16 millimeter yeah, you know, the crew of STS-48 would just uh, you know, like to thank you. That was quite a show you put on for our one-year anniversary today. Yeah, Red Shift started working on a material science experiment. Uh, this is a crystallization experiment using image mirror furnace. And I became also a subject of four different uh, Japanese experiments. Uh, this is a... Uh, a uh, perceptual motor function experiment using a joystick. And uh, in those experiments, scientists on the ground uh, checked my eye movement while I attempted to track the uh, flickering light. Twice a day, of course, we would hand over the vehicle. We were working a dual shift mission. We had the red shift and the blue shift. So in the morning, we'd hand over from blue to red. In the evening, we would hand over from red to blue, uh, handing over both the orbiter functions and the space lab. On the blue shift, we did the free flow electrophoresis experiment, which is a Japanese experiment. We're passing electrical current through uh, some biological materials to separate them out according to their electric potential. We uh, had three of these experiments scheduled, and we were able to do two extra ones during the flight. So we feel like we had a really good uh, experiment there, very successful, even though we did lose some of the downlink data. One of the experiments that you've heard a lot about was lower body negative pressure. And these are just images from the lower body negative pressure. The objectives of that experiment was to really see how the heart adjusts to microgravity and to figure out, can you use lower body negative pressure as a countermeasure to help people to readjust when they come back. Some of the other experiments that we did that dealt with medical uh, issues were a fluid therapy system. Um, the fluid therapy system we used really talked about uh, can you produce IV fluids in space and whether or not you're able to uh, successfully administer them. But we did spend a lot of time working with lower body negative pressure and we got lots of results back, good results back. While the Space Lab crew was busy working back in the lab, the orbiter crew was also busy on the mid-deck. We had several experiments uh, that we ran. Uh, one of these is the protein crystal growth, which uh, we see here being activated once we got on orbit. The, uh, another experiment we had going was a medical uh, data take of energy utilization, and we uh, collected uh, uh, some blood samples, tests for glucose, and we logged all the food and water and uh, some urine samples we took to better understand how the body actually uses the food that we intake while we're in a zero-g environment. 
The first thing I had to do in the morning right after I woke up uh, was to attach three different electrodes on my body. Except the fourth and fifth days, I wore all the time a backpack called uh, PMS and to monitor my electrocardiogram and uh, retrograde wave and skin conductance level. Every day uh, in the afternoon, I wear this uh, and uh, I spent a couple of hours to uh, conduct cell culture experiment using a specially designed uh, culture kit and optical microscope. We mainly observed uh, how cells are uh, developed under micro G and took many uh, microscopic pictures. Hello, Akiko and uh, Kenta to you. I'm very fine here in New Dick. Um, I just am enjoying, uh, started enjoying uh, and doing a lot of work so that I'm pretty busy. But I hope you are uh, doing quite uh, well, all of you. Uh, I'm not sure if we had a record number of in-flight maintenance procedures, but we did have some fairly critical ones. Uh, early in the mission, we had a, a water leak in the material science rack, and we went in there, and it was a fairly uh, simple thing to fix once we took the insulation away. It was similar to just fixing a leaky faucet uh, at home, but it uh, kept the, the loop intact, and we were able to continue with furnaces such as this, which is the image mirror furnace. Uh, it was one of the well, funded projects to work on on orbit because it was rather interactive. You had to establish a melt zone. In this particular scene, we're putting a quartz tube uh, around the sample. And then once we got the uh, image mirror closed, we went ahead and brought the samples uh, together. And uh, we bring them together so that the focus of the, there's a light bulb in the back and also one in, in, the, in the cover. Uh, the focus of the energy is on the gap between the two samples. Uh, this was uh, one of them that we did. Uh, we did two other uh, experiments in the, in the image mirror furnace. One of them was a glass cube experiment. Uh, this glass cube, we were, the objective was to turn it into uh, a glass sphere and do some measurements. Uh, in this particular case, uh, the temperature got a little bit higher uh, than we expected. Uh, and I guess it's one of the reasons that you do experiments to try to understand the reaction to certain materials in zero gravity. And the other one that was, uh, looks like it's very successful was our Samarskite sample. We have a sample here that's about Oh, I guess uh, you know, six to eight millimeters long. In addition to the image furnace, we also had uh, some other major furnaces in the two material science racks. We had four other major furnaces, including this one, which was a continuous heating furnace, which had two heating chambers and two cooling chambers. Of course, we also had the large isothermal furnace and the gradient heating furnace, as well as our acoustic levitation furnace, which we were able to uh, conduct our experiments because we had the uh, the water leak fixed in the material science racks for a total of 22 material science experiments. A link video from the Space Lab module with mission specialists Mae Jemison and Jan Davis performing two experiments at this time. Jan Davis is working with the continuous heating furnace and working on the uh, aluminum composite experiment. She's uh, involved in the first sample installation of this uh, experiment. And uh, Space Lab Huntsville, we're getting a great view of you two. Uh, we noticed that uh, Jan's headband is uh, a little bit loose, uh, her AFTE headband. But um, this is a great view, and you guys are, are really looking good.
Uh, May Jimison works with the gas bulb experiment, the activation and uh, the preparation. Looking at the gas evaporation facility, we can see the filament inside the bulb. Looking through a TV camera attached to the facility. And uh, Space Lab Huntsville, we've got live video in the module, and we see uh, May down working on GEF, looking great. Go on my mark. Three, two, one, mark. Copy. Space Lab Operations in Huntsville getting a uh, an excellent view and downlink video of the gas bulb with the filament inside the bulb. We had a couple of audio dosimeters that we kept in place in different parts of the orbiter. Every time I came back to do one, uh, the payload commander accused me of coming back to perform pilot science. So this is a little bit of pilot science that we're seeing right here. <laughs> and uh, this is a, a study in angular momentum. And of course, we're all familiar with the way an ice skater uh, starts out with their arms out and retracts their arms to increase the uh, rotational speed. And uh, our pilot is here uh, checking it out to see that it does, in fact, work in, in weightlessness. This spooled him up pretty good. Watch, <laughs> watch his eyes when he finishes. Yeah, that's OK. <laughs> <laughs> we had a uh, relatively new piece of gear on board, the bicycle ergometer, and uh, this is really a, a, a wonderful contraption, and we were uh, able to use this up on the flight deck, and it's quiet enough that we're able to, to exercise during sleep periods. Well, after a busy day of doing experiments and uh, working out, we headed for the galley, and the chow up there is really pretty good. Here's uh, Mark making a meal, and uh, we were very fortunate to eat uh, early and often during this mission, and uh, we all liked it. And we found uh, chopsticks up there are pretty practical in zero G, although uh, you'll notice our Japanese payload specialist is having cross-cultural experience. He's the one using the spoon. Uh, but we found uh, curried rice up there was superb, and uh, I'm going to recommend taking it uh, as a standard item. Chopsticks were real good for most of the foods we ate up there, but not for all of them, so we used other techniques. Uh, for uh, certain foods that we ate there. And here you'll see it um, getting ready to get dark up there, which of course it did 16 times a day. And it, uh, it gets dark in a big hurry, as you're just about to see uh, out the window there right behind Kurt. Just like on Earth, uh, you have certain personal hygiene things you uh, must take care of. This is the red shift, getting up and getting ready to go to work for a day and uh, doing a little uh, teeth brushing there and uh, washing our hair. and. Uh, our commander, you know, he, he can only do so much with what you got to work with, but <laughs> he's, uh, he's doing his best here. And it's actually pretty easy in space. You don't have to find a wall to hang a mirror on. You can kind of just let it hang around. But uh, he's, he's working away there. Takes a little while to get ready in the morning. <laughs> I understand that four members of our flight uh, had a lot of interesting publicity down here. The frog embryology experiment was one that I think was very successful. We um, took four female frogs up. We, we uh, gave them a hemochorionic gonadotroph and caused them to ovulate. We were able to actually uh, have over 100 live tadpoles that were brought back that were actually conceived and born in space. And here is the other abnormal egg. You can see it's uh, starting to sidelize. It's broken. Yeah, may I copy that? Uh, this last frog has uh, several abnormal looking eggs. We don't like this last one uh, much at all. One of the things we also wanted to look at was how, what was the behavior? Was there a problem with um, their tadpole's interpretation of what goes on in zero-g? Can they swim normally? 
So we actually took up tadpoles that were hatched here on the, on the ground and watched their swimming behavior. Some of the things it seemed like is that they had a difficult time figuring out um, which way to swim, as you can see. So they swim in circles. But we're able to uh, bring tadpoles back down and also observe their behavior. The science team here in Huntsville watching the swimming behavior of the tadpoles in the uh, two-part flask. Downlink television from the payload bay of Endeavour now showing sun glint on Vancouver in British Columbia. Uh, these are uh, oriental hornets. They have a unique ability to build combs, and uh, that those combs are uh, oriented in the direction of gravity. So the uh, objective here is to uh, determine what effect uh, uh, the absence of gravity as a reference point will have on their, uh, uh, on their activities in uh, building combs or uh, We also did our uh, studies on the blue shift of angular momentum, and since I am an ice skater, it was uh, kind of fun to play with pulling my arms in, going faster, and then putting them back out and uh, slowing down. We also had fun with uh, other things and watching the physics of how they behave when we spin them around. Those are a pair of pliers. And we're in the midst of a uh, photo frenzy at a Sarex contact. Now receiving downlight TV from the aft flight deck. That mission last time of eight hours, 16 minutes on the second day of flight. This is Mission Control Houston. Jay is using SORAX, which is a Nottingham radio equipment to communicate uh, directly to the people on the ground. We contacted many schools around the world. Uh, here, we flew over Japan. It was very impressive for me to see my hometown uh, from space. This is Hokkaido, uh, just uh, we saw, uh, Northern Island of Japan. Sapporo is the capital of the uh, Hokkaido, where I used to work. Now, most of the time when we flew over Japan uh, uh, was cloudy, but I had uh, one time to see a Tokyo metropolitan area. I was very much impressed that uh, Tokyo Bay was very clean, as you see there. This downlink television from Endeavour is of the Oregon coast and the Willamette Valley. Right now we can see, it, see the cities of Eugene and Salem, and just out of sight on the right of the picture is Portland. This is Hurricane uh, Bonnie, which was about 500 miles north-northeast of uh, Bermuda when we took this photo, and you can see the spiral bands around in the well-developed eye. It's a classic hurricane. Just after that, we got ready to check out the vehicle uh, for landing, and here we are checking out the elevons during what we call the flight control system checkout. You can see them moving back there uh, on uh, the wing in this wide-angle view. And we were well satisfied the vehicle was ready for entry, and so was the ground. Well, after a very successful mission, it's time to come home, even though we got an extra day. So we had to prepare the vehicle for entry, got in our suits, got all strapped back in. 
uh, made our deorbit burn, and that was very successful, and we're on our way home. This is a view out my window. We're in the, the red is a glow from entering the atmosphere, the, uh, the excitation that orbit does, and you can see the sunrise. We're in a big right bank at that point. Uh, back uh, in the lower atmosphere, with the hoot flying here, we are starting to get some uh, tips off the wings, and uh, then doing some more checking, we'll be in our right turn here on our heading alignment circle, preparing to roll out on final uh, to complete the landing phase. The uh, orbiter, as you see, looks like it's uh, a very nice flying aircraft. Uh, it looks very, uh, very happy in that environment there. Uh, on the ground, it looks like it's uh, falling like a brick, as we probably all know. <laughs> We had had a lot of concern about the weather at the Cape and being able to get back in there, but as you can see, we had just an absolutely beautiful day to come back to uh, the Kennedy Space Center. Air suit rolling out on final, and uh, shortly you'll see him put the nose down a little bit. We'll pick up some more airspeed and uh, prepare for the final landing phase. Uh, I got to fly the orbiter for a few seconds uh, on entry, and uh, thanks to Hoot, and uh, the, uh, the orbiter flies very nicely. It flies like a much smaller aircraft than it really is. Uh, very nice handling machine. Endeavour Houston, looking good on final. You'll still go for the drag shoot DTO. Surface winds are calm. Okay, copy. Endeavour's wings leveling. Altitude 9,000 feet, six miles to touchdown. Speed 297 knots, 6,000 feet. Three thousand feet. As we come in, you can still see the, the, the moisture off our uh, wings getting ready. My primary job in life now is to put the gear down. There comes the gear. And uh, here's the commander coming in for a very, very spectacular landing. Uh, hit all the parameters that we're looking for as we come in to land. Very nice touchdown. Landing gear down and locked. We touched down at 205 knots. And uh, shortly after down. that, uh, we were calling out airspeed. We we're looking for. 175 knots, and at a point we, uh, I got to deploy the drag chute. We were the first uh, deploy with the nose still in the air, a test deploy. that we were doing to hopefully expand the envelope, and then the nose touched down about 130 nose gear knots. Approaching about 60 knots, we've gotten about all we could out of the drag chute, so we go ahead and jettison, and then we let the orbiter roll to a stop like in the previous mission. Houston Endeavour, we have wheel stop. Roger, wheel stop. Endeavour, congratulations on a highly successful and historic mission. Stand by for post-landing deltas. As I mentioned, this was the conclusion of a very successful mission. We had just uh, one, one redshift handover, one redshift tag up left to make. And this is uh, <laughs> Kurt and I having our final redshift tag up just after we'd rolled to a stop. Japanese payload specialist Mamoru Mori. Mae Jameson, mission specialist, along with Jan Davis, mission specialist, and Jay Apt. Mark Lee, who was payload commander of the flight, Kurt Brown, and the commander of the mission was Robert Hoot Gibson. The astronauts are now uh, preparing to board the Astrovan. It's a specially outfitted recreation vehicle that the astronauts travel back and forth to the pad in and which they'll be heading back to their astronaut crew quarters.